Welcome, friends. I'm Pastor Jason Neely. I'm the pastor at Delta First Assembly of God. I want to say thank you for coming to this website and checking us out today. And, and I hope that this message that you're about to hear will powerfully impact you in a meaningful way. Well, hopefully somebody learned something today. And there's several of you that are an old hat, an old hand at Facebook. You know it pretty well. And so this is just redundant information for you. But there's a lot of people kind of on the fringe, like myself, that we don't really know how we can help the church and help the, the family of faith increase its online footprint. Now, some of us don't want any kind of an online footprint at all. But for the church, we want a big footprint. You know, we want to have a big footprint out there where people can find us. You know, they say that you know, when you're finding real estate and looking at different places to buy for real estate, it's location, 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 right? Well, on the internet, this is how you get location, location, location. You get out there, you, you like stuff, you share stuff, and let people know what you're about. And so this morning, as we segue into the scriptures today, I'd like you to open your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to share with you this morning faith book, applying a faith book to our lives. And as you're turning there, I want to say thank you to the many of you that have been praying for mom and dad. Mom and dad are part of the, they're in charge of the Ravens Mexico Ministries. They left uh, last Friday morning. They had a motor home. They've been donated to them to be a, a kind of a base camp for our, our water drillers. And uh, dad worked on that RV for a month getting it ready to go, getting it ready to travel. My, our main concern was getting it over Red Mountain Pass. Well, it made it past Red Mountain Pass and into Durango, but outside of uh, uh, one of the communities there in, in New Mexico, Cuba, New Mexico, I believe it was, it, it blew a fuel line in the engine compartment, sprayed fuel everywhere, it caught fire, and the RV burned completely down to the asphalt. And so they lost the rig completely. It's gone. Um, they managed to get everybody out. They managed to get all the luggage out in time. Uh, they lost some of the tools that were in the back of the rig. Um, but they're fine. They just went on. They just piled in a whole bunch of people in the Suburban, and they crammed the suitcases all the way to the ceiling, and they went on. They crossed into Mexico yesterday um, and had a, a good smooth crossing and only half of the tax that they usually have to pay. So that was a, a silver lighting. So continue to keep mom and dad in prayers. That's always discouraging when you work on something for a month and then it burns to the ground right in front of you. They're on the highway. So that's always a little embarrassing, a little humiliating. It's, it's devastating. So 10 o'clock at night, uh, dad called me and uh, said he was still talking to the cops, uh, trying to figure out what to do with the carcass. Um, so it's quite a, quite a deal. Thank you for your prayers, friends, in, in, their, in their behalf. And mom and dad are always doing something interesting, aren't they? They're always having some kind of event. I mean, he was carjacked by the cartel, told to lay it face down in the ditch at gunpoint, uh, crashed a plane there in Mexico, you know, nose down into the airstrip and blew up the plane. Uh, now they just blew up the RV. I mean, you could really hang out with mom and dad and have a blast. <laughs> it's awesome. <clears throat> Um, also, be praying for our students right now are engaged in ministry there at Olathe. We've got about 50 or 60 people over there at the Olathe, uh, the Olathe Church that's over there, a part of our faith community, our sister congregation. So we've got uh, 50 or 60 people over there enjoying uh, the fine arts ministry. And that's what it's all about. It's not about competing, right? It's about ministering and sharing Jesus with people. Amen? So that's what they're doing right now. We blessed our teenagers to go and enjoy that time. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, if you're there, say Amen. Let's look at verse 19 and begin there. This is Paul talking to the church in Corinth. Paul says, Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, the Gentiles, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Let's pray. 
Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word, for this passage that Paul has written to the church of Corinth. God, may we also have that same passion and that, that same driving force within us, that burning that's within us that says, I want to win some. God, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll do whatever is necessary, Lord, to spread the gospel. God, let me become like those that need the gospel so that I can win some more. Paul became all things to all men. God, what can I do? Lord, to win one more soul for the kingdom of God. God, open our eyes today to show us what we can do in this part of our life. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. 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 In a moment, we're going to turn to the book of Acts chapter 17. So you go ahead and start heading to that direction if you'd like. But the first of four points this morning, we were talking about our faith book. The first thing that we do in our life is we like it. That's one of the things we talk about on Facebook is liking something, right? That's a little thumbs up thing. We like something on Facebook. And our life and our spiritual journey is a lot like that. Thumbsing up, liking it. Now, our culture today has always gauged the popularity of everything by how much it is liked. We buy reviews at the library or at the bookstore. We, we diff- look at different things and we get consumer reports. We find out how, how well our our products are liked. We find out what the, the best cars and trucks are by how well they're liked, and they get ratings, don't they? And Facebook, friends, has changed our world today. The entire culture of the world has been impacted by Facebook. The entire world. There are many, many more Facebook users in Asia than there are in America. In fact, the, the Asian, the Southeast Asian community is three times larger in Facebook users than here in America. Therefore, the biggest Facebook market is global, is worldwide. And Facebook just made a, a goal saying they wanted to reach X amount of billions of people by 2020. I don't know how many billions of people there are in this world, 7 or 8 billion, but their goal is to reach about 4 or 5 billion by 2020. That means every single household in the world will use that medium. Friends, that is the same call that Jesus Christ has given the church. That's the same commission that Jesus Christ gave you and me to reach every single household for the name of Jesus. What happened there in the first century is something called the Hellenistic culture. Hellenistic culture was the Greek culture. Greek was the worldwide language at the time. It was the the business language. Everybody spoke Greek. You may have spoke two or three other languages as well. But the Hellenism that took place in the spreading of Greek thought, uh, Greek art, Greek culture was worldwide. Of the known world at that time, it affected everything. Everybody knew what it was about. And the Facebook is much like that. You can't get away from it. No matter how much you may dislike it or disagree with it, you cannot escape it. Just like the Jews in the time of Christ in the the first century could not escape Greek culture. The Jews did not like the idols that were brought in. They didn't like what what the Hellenism stood for. They didn't want anything to do with it. They saw it as a tremendous secularization of their culture and of their faith. But they could not get away from it. It was in everything When we like something, we understand today that that people in this day and age are finding greater and greater value in being liked. It used to be to be a tough guy, you'd say, well, I don't need to be liked. I don't need anybody to like me. I don't need anybody to love me. I am not defined by who likes me or does not like me. But in today's culture, our younger generations are finding their, their own value on Facebook or on social media. They're finding their own value in how well they are liked. They gauge themselves by how many friends they have, and they gauge themselves by how many likes they get on their page. And if they have very low numbers, they feel that is something that, 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 that defeats them. They deal with that, and they struggle with that emotionally. A lot of our younger generations are plugged into that in that way. That is their social network. Emotionally, people have always wanted to be liked, but people today are emotionally engaged through their Internet profile. How many of you guys saw the shooting at UCLA this last week when they, uh, there in LA, there was, a, there was a shooting at the college campus there and everybody was, uh, was freaked out about it, right? And kids were barricading themselves with belts, you know, around the doorknobs and trying to stack chairs and corners against the doors because they didn't know if they had an active shooter in the school. And they, one of the students took a picture of all the kids barricaded in that room and, you know, not a single one of the kids was having a conversation. 
Every single one of them was on their smartphone. They're in an active shooter situation, and every single individual, like 20, 20 students, is on their cell phone, you know, texting, they're messaging, they're, they're putting things on Facebook. That is how our younger generations communicate. If they dialogue, they don't make eye contact anymore. Okay? If they are dialoguing with you, they're doing all their multitasking on their phone. You need to understand that that's their culture and that's the way that they do things and that bothers the older cultures, the older generations. Because we're like saying, make eye, con make eye contact with me, look at me when I talk to you. But that's not what they're used to, that's not what they're comfortable with. They can multitask, they're hearing you just fine and they're responding with you just fine, but they're, they're multitasking on that, on that smartphone. That is, the, that is the most commonly used tool in the world today. You may not like that fact, but it is indeed a fact. Friends, we know that that's not the way that the early church was operated, of course. The body of Christ in the first century got together because they felt the love and the warmth of belonging to that bigger church family. Today, that love and that warmth of a relationship is being replaced by the artificial love and warmth online. A lot of times we will spend eight hours of our day on the internet, but yet we'll only spend maybe 20 minutes interacting with humanity, interacting with other people. 40%, friends, of all downloads on the internet are pornographic in nature. 40% of all data downloaded is porn. Two and a half billion emails a day contain pornography. I can't even think in terms like that. I can't even think in the massive amount of, of, of numbers like that. Two and a half billion emails a day. Because it is artificial relationships trying to replace face-to-face -face contact and face-to-face -face interaction. The older generations use Facebook. They use Facebook for news and information. The younger generations use it for views and for affirmation. There was one young lady that we were talking with uh, a while back, and she talked to my wife. She came to Carmen, and she was upset at my wife. She says, you don't like me. You obviously don't like me, and you, you, you hate me or something like that because you never like any of my posts on Facebook. You never like any of my pictures on Facebook. So there's obviously something wrong between me and you because the, the younger generation that that young lady was a part of found value in everything being liked on her Facebook page. And she draw, drew an assumption with my wife not liking her because she didn't boost or like any of her photos or any of her posts. Younger generations find value in that way. That's how they find their affirmation today is online. So every time we'd have a meeting with this young lady, my wife would have to reassure her and, and, and tell her, you know what, we don't go through everybody's profile and like everything. My wife has got hundreds of friends on her Facebook. We don't have time to go through and like everything of your posts, okay? The thing is, people draw emotional support and interaction from online. And as much as we may preach against that or as much as we try to encourage the younger generations that that is not where your value is found, Many of our young people do still find value in that, and they will continue to find value in that. So you'll need to find a way to adapt to the way they're thinking. And as these younger generations mature, they also will be able to adapt their ways of thinking and finding that their self-esteem uh, uh, is not built on an online profile. There's young... Uh, some of our young people come to us in, in youth groups sometime and they, they approach Pastor Darby or they approach Carmen again and they say, I'm so depressed. I'm so depressed. I, my online world has been totally wrecked. My online accounts have been totally ruined. Somebody has smeared my name on the internet. People that don't even know me are calling me names and there's a lot of different cyber bullies that are out there. And P, our young people's lives are being ruined by these individuals who are posting nasty things about our young people online on Facebook. One young lady said, I'm so depressed right now because I, I only got 30 likes on my picture. I only got 30 likes. and So they're saying, is there something wrong with my picture? Am I not pretty enough? Am I not good looking enough? because I usually get 60 or 70. And so these young ladies are questioning themselves and saying, well, I'm obviously not pretty anymore. 
friends, we have got to continue to hedge against the destructiveness of that type of thinking because our value is not in our online profile. Our value is with interaction with people. It's with people. They're in the book of Acts chapter 17. Turn there now if you haven't already. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul used social media of his day. If he was alive today, he would use Facebook and social media to advance the cause of Christ, most certainly. The book of Acts chapter 17, Paul used the social media of what he could in his day. Verse 22, he's meeting there in Athens, right? <clears throat> he's trying to minister to this city, this pagan city of Athens. Verse 22 says that Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Now what you worship is something unknown. I am going to proclaim to you. Paul then goes on and tells about Jesus Christ and what he has done. About what Jesus Christ, how he, how he, he lived for his people. Then he died for his people and how he rose again and how he ascended into heaven for his people so that we might all have eternal life. He was in an, an uncomfortable environment. He walked around Athens and the scripture tells us he was greatly distressed there in verse 16. Acts 17, verse 16, it says, while Paul was waiting for his friends, for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. It bothered Paul to see what he was seeing. And friends, it may bother you today to see where our country is going, and it may bother you today to see what's happening on the Internet. But friends, you can't stop it. You can't stop that train. Therefore, you've got to find a way to use it to the glory of God. When the television and the radio was invented, it had tremendous support, had tremendous promise, disseminating the gospel over the airwaves, over the television waves. The internet is also a great and powerful tool for the dissemination of the word and gospel of Jesus Christ. If you can't beat it, join it, friends. But know that it is a double-edged sword. Apostle Paul is there in, in Athens sitting at the Oropagus. The Oropagus was named after a pagan god. You ever heard of Ares? Ares, the god of war. The Roman counterpart to Ares is one of your favorite candy bars. Every time you buy this candy bar at the store, you're buying this candy bar and you're stuffing it into your face and it is a pagan, pagan candy bar. And I love it. It's my favorite candy bar, the Mars bar. Mars. Mars is the god of war. The Greek counterpart is Ares, the god of war. Mars. Okay, it, it's part of it, paganism. Paganism is all around us, friends. It's not going away. You have to understand what it is. You know, eating that Mars bar is not going to send me to hell. It's chocolate, and it's awesome. That nuggety, the almonds, I love that stuff. It, it's so wonderful. But Mars, it's Mars Hill. And this was called the Sermon of Paul on Mars Hill. The Areopagus. Ares, Aero, Pagus, Hill, Mars Hill. The Hill of Ares, the Hill of Mars. Friends, Paul had the opportunity to deride and condemn the gods of the Athenians. Why didn't Paul stand up there and say, you bunch of godless people, you bunch of pagans, you nasty people bow down to all these idols, you don't even know which one you worship. Paul had the opportunity to say that, didn't he? But he did not. He did not say that. Younger generations today have their methods for finding faith, and a lot of that involves the Internet, a lot of that involves Facebook a lot of the older generations that we have today are, are beginning to catch on and are using these same methods because they want to talk to their kids, because they want to talk to their, their grandkids. There's a lot of money involved in Facebook. I don't know if it's the biggest company in the world, but if not, it's in the second or third biggest company in the world. All of you that have a 401k or have investments, you probably have some ownership of Facebook and Google in your accounts, in your mutual funds. All of you own it, and you don't even know it. Because there's huge, tremendous money in Facebook. There's tremendous money in social media. Facebook generates one and a half million dollars every hour. Facebook generates, uh, the last estimates of a, of a year ago, $10 billion a year in sales ads. 
There's money in it. Paul acknowledged that the Athenians were a very religious people. He looked around and said, I, I acknowledge you're very spiritual. I see how religious you are. He didn't confirm or deny that. He didn't, he didn't condemn that. He confirmed it. Just like today here in America. Americans are certainly a spiritual people, just like the Athenians. They just don't know which God to follow. But they certainly have an opinion about each one. A lot of our universities today, we're sending our young people to, they're exposed to all of these different worldviews, and that's good. But then they're told about which ones would be, be very tolerant. They love Hinduism. They love Islam. They love Buddhism. They love Confucianism. They love all of these different religions that are out there. But when it comes to Christianity, that is one to be sneered upon, is the one to be spat upon, is the one to be turned against and, and, and rejected. That's our universities today is much like what Paul walked into they're in Athens. They have an opinion about all the different faiths that are surrounding them. But Paul stood up and said, let me tell you about the one that you don't know about. The, the, the idol that's sitting here that says to an unknown God, let me tell you about that unknown God. He didn't deride that idol standing there. He built upon that. He didn't condemn that idol sitting there. He built the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ upon that foundation. But the Athenians were known to be the people that just sat around and listened to, to new ideas. But they made no decisions in regards to their faith. They made no decisions in regards to their faith. They like to sit around and talk about it. You know, the Athenians never won a war. <laughs> Every time they got into a major conflict, they always got beat down. They, they'd rise up, and they'd want to have uh, an overture, a riot, and different things. And conquerors would come and go, and every time the Athenians never won a war because they were too busy sitting on their tails talking about ideas and ideologies, and never training for what was coming around the corner. Friends, the faith that we have today is a faith that demands a decision. The faith that we have as Christians today is a faith that will invoke a change of heart. The faith that we have today as believers will invoke a change in the way that we live. We must live differently than the world lives. Our demeanor must change as Christians. Our attitude must change as believers. Our vocabulary must change the closer we get to Christ. What we watch is not going to be the same things that the world watches, and the things that we listen to are not going to be the same things that the world listens to. The websites that the world pushes upon us are not to be the websites that the believers should visit. Friends, the majority of the men in this church, the majority of men in any American church are engaged in pornography at their homes. But sometimes we wonder why the American church can't stand up and become extremely powerful again like we see in the first century is because the priests of our homes have been compromised. Friends, Paul cried out. Paul did not win over very many that day. But Scripture tells us that he won some. Is that not Paul's mission and goal, what we read there in 1 Corinthians? That I might win some? We got to do what we've got to do. Yes, the, the internet is full of darkness, but it is also full of potential and it's also full of light. It's not going away. We've got to find ways where we can guard our minds, guard our eyes, guard our ears, but yet go into the battlefields of this world so that we might win some. Because our youngest generations are being lost. Because our youngest generations are there on the internet. You want to find those kids, get on the keyboard. You got four main points today. That's the first one. The others are more brief. We've talked about liking it. The second thing we understand about church is we need to check in. <laughs> checking in. Pastor Darby mentioned about checking in. Letting people know you're there. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 says this, Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. Paul is talking to the, to the people there in Hebrews. We're assuming that Paul is the author of the book of Hebrews here. But he says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Some Christians, even in this first century church, had given up meeting together because they were probably introvert like me. They didn't need a lot of people to be around them. They didn't feed off of a social uh, quagmire that's around them. They didn't need that. And so we kind of will step back and start fading away from church. 
But the Bible says, let us not give up meeting together as some in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. And that is the way the church exists today, is to encourage one another. A pastor of a church this size cannot go around and encourage everybody. That's an impossibility. We go to church so we might obtain encouragement from one another. The person that's sitting next to you, the person sitting in front of you or behind you, that is your job, to encourage one another. Friends, a lot of people like church, but they rarely go. The existence of a church comforts many people. They like to know that the church is there if it's ever needed. It's kind of like the local mechanic, isn't it? <laughs> You're happy that the mechanic is there, but you can get by without them. You can do most of your own work. You only need the mechanic shop for the really major stuff. And when you go, you go begrudgingly to the mechanic and with a lot of demands. Fix this sound. Fix this right. Make it right. A lot of people like to go to church and they go to church for the first time and the emotions of going to the mechanic for the first time or going to church for the first time oftentimes are parallel. They have a lot of the same emotional feelings. They're, they're angry to have to be going <laughs> in the first place. They may be filled with anxiety or frustrations, fearful of being taken for a ride, knowing you're going to be getting dinged financially, but not sure how much you're going to get dinged until the very end when the bill comes in. They're suspicious of the work being done, not sure if you can trust the people working on your car, afraid of being taken advantage of. Whenever I go to visit a church, even though I'm a well-seasoned pastor, I try to hide behind the scenes. I try to lurk in the shadows. I don't want to be, have any kind of spotlights on me. I like to slip in and slip out. And some of those emotions that we have going to a mechanic for the first time emulate a lot of church. How am I going to get burned in this situation? There's a young couple that I know that should be in church, but they're not. I know they were both raised in church from little children all the way up into adulthood. And now they themselves have little children and they're not involved in church and they're not raising their kids in church. There's always a lot of excuses. There's a lot of homework to do. They got to catch up on work. They got to, uh, they're too tired. We've bumped into them a little bit recently and they've been at the lake a little bit. They bought, a, they bought some, some new watercrafts, you know, and they're excited about using those things. And I'm not going to take any of that away from anybody. Those are fun things to enjoy. But there's always going to be an excuse to not go to church, to be encouraged. Friends, we've got to be understand. We, we need to check in to church. Liking church is fine, but we really need to be there and be present so that we can be encouraged. They like church, but some of these people never check in. Friends, when you check into church, you're telling people what is important to you. It's a way to share with others by your very presence that you are a believer and that you are a part of the body of Christ. People have an, a, a better idea about what you stand for. Don't make people guess in regards to what you're about. Make certain people know what you're about. Thirdly, it's to tag and to share. There on Facebook, we tag and share our life with our friends, and, and, it, and it spreads like a virus. They call it going viral. When you share something, when you tag something, it goes into other people's websites. Some of us have seen that ridiculous Chewbacca lady on the internet the last two weeks. I watched that for the first time, and I look up at my wife, and I'm not impressed. I'm like, really? You know? Really? Chewbacca lady? Ends up she's one of our praise and worship leaders down there in Texas. And one of our, one of our universities just gave her kids a full-ride scholarship to college. I'm like, really? Some of you guys have no idea what I'm talking about, and that's okay. You just... Google it after service, Chewbacca lady, or something like that. This lady bought a Chewbacca mask and put it on, and every time her mouth opens, a Chewbacca noise comes out. Oh, you know, it's something crazy. And this went crazy viral. It got like a million hits, and she was interviewed a couple days later on Good Morning America, Today Show, and interviewed all over the place for putting on a stinking mask. I said, honey, when Judah gets close to going to college, put on a dumb mask and make a fool of yourself, and maybe we can get a free ride scholarship for that. <laughs> because this world is involved in how much it's liked. The world loves to have fun. The world loves something that's enjoyable. 
people, the, the world loves things that are nonsensical that bring a smile to our, faith, our faces. People buy into that. So when people are looking at you, does your faith bring a smile to people's faces? Do people enjoy being around you? Because that is what is attractive. And that's how this lady, one of our praise and worship leaders down in Texas, got all this blessing coming her way because she was being silly and shared her silliness with the world and the world bought into it. For a moment in time, you have 10 minutes of fame. How would you use that? She used it to the glory of God. Friends, when we tag and when we share, we touch people's lives. When we used to play tag at school, what happened? When you tag someone at school, the responsibility changed from one person to another. You got one other person involved in the game. There was a role reversal, isn't there? It gets other people involved. Some might say they would never go to church, but they might come to your house. They might come to a park for root beer floats and play kickball. They might go out to the shooting range out in the big ditch by the airport. Get people involved. Liking something is nominal commitment. Sharing and tagging Christ is a full commitment. Everyone knows when you share. We need to be a people that moves from liking Jesus to a people that shares Jesus with others in life and on the internet. If Jesus was to look at your Facebook page, what would he say? Would he like it or would he share it? Fourth and finally is to review. A lot of reviews. We talked about Google reviews this morning, yellow page reviews, uh, different things that are out there. We like to review stuff, don't we? There's Angie's List. We see Angie's List. I'm like, really? We're never going to use that. But it's gotten huge. Angie's List reviews. We live in an environment today that reviews everything, friends. We feel empowered when we can put a star on someone or take a star away. We feel the power and the might of that. We like that. But friends, we base our decisions on other people's experiences. We go on Facebook. We ask people out there, hey, who knows a good mechanic shop here in town? And you'll have many different people come on with a lot of reviews that say the best ones. And you say, well, this, this mechanic shop is mentioned three times positively, so I'll try them first. We use Facebook as a review platform to decide where we're going to go try first. And that's what, that's what this Social Media Sunday is about. That's what this faith book is about. Getting your, the views out there on the web. You may not be into it, but, but the majority of people today are. Over half of our visitors today come to our church because they saw something on the internet about us. Over half. Therefore, if it's important to them, it should be important to us. Friends, we live in a research-based culture today. Very few people go to a church based on the name of the door anymore. They will go to a church that has an internet presence. Friends, one day we too will be reviewed by God. The Bible tells us that in heaven the books will be opened in Revelation chapter 20 and a review of our lives will take place. We like reviewing other people. But we don't necessarily care to be reviewed and judged ourselves. We have created an environment that has a tremendous amount of pushback against judgment. But friends, one thing that God's going to do someday, God is going to have a judgment with us. He's going to have a review with us. How many stars is God going to give your profile? What have you done in this life that God is going to review? Some of us will be given five stars. Others of us perhaps three few of us, maybe even one star, but there's going to be a lot of people that God will give no stars to. Friends, where are we at in our faith journey, in our walk? What does our faith book look like in our lives? Would you stand this morning as we close with Pastor Darby, would you come? Friend, what kind of ratings would God give your faith book account? Some of us are what they call lurkers. We lurk on the internet and we look at everybody else, what's going on in their life, but we never post. And that's me. I don't really look at everybody's posting or anything, but I like to know what's going on in the life of my church people. I like to know what's going on in my community. A lot of the information that we get as pastors doesn't come over the telephone. Most of our information comes across the internet about what's going on in people's lives. That is a platform for us to react to meet the needs of our people.
when there's a tragedy, when there's a trial, we find out via the internet. It's a good platform. But when someday happens, when whether Jesus comes back and the rapture takes place or we die here and then we are stand before God later, God's going to say, what did you do with the tools that I gave you? The Bible says the books are going to be open because you know what? God's writing our life down. He's recording everything. He's writing this mess down. And there's going to be a review with us someday. Thank you, friends, for watching today's message. I pray that it ministered to you in a powerful way. If you ever want to check us out for our contact information, just look again on the website, call the office, or check on Facebook at Delta First Assembly of God Church. Thanks again. God bless you.